I'd like to hand over to um, Ava Darylova, who's our keynote speaker. Thank you very much for coming. And um, I'm really looking forward. I mean, one of the things we all worry about is, in, in numerical programming is, well, how big, you know, how big are the errors here? You know, I worry about did I commit some floating point crime? And uh, you know, is RK4 really good enough for this? Should I be using a higher order method? And anyway, without further ado, I'll let Ava tell us all about it. Thank you very much, Ava. Thank you very much for the introduction. So unfortunately, I wasn't there at Oxford last year, but I'm very happy to be here. So hopefully, I can give you some hope for the full effect errors, but just don't get your hopes up too much. <laughs> um, so I'm going to be talking about the tool Daisy, uh, which I've been essentially working on for the last three years at MPI SWS, together with my students, Heiko Anastasia, the Mashwinta, and a bunch of collaborators. Um, before I start, um, I'm keeping this talk high level on purpose because I want to bring the ideas across. If you have more detailed questions, just feel free to ask during the talk or afterwards. So, oh, just a bit. Daisy is based on the observations that on the observation that approximations are quite often, very often inevitable. So this may be because we have limited resources, so we don't want to wait forever until a computation finishes, or we have limited memory and energy and so on. Or it could be that an exact solution actually does not exist. So we all know we can't compute uh, all real numbered results uh, on a digital computer. So these approximations naturally introduce some errors, and as a verification person, I'm wondering, well, how big are these errors, and, well, is this good enough? Well, thankfully, good enough, so we don't ex necessarily need the exact solution, but good enough is quite often uh, sufficient for many applications, because they may, just as an embedded system, that uh, operate in a noisy environment, so the inputs and the outputs are not accurate anyway, so we don't need to do the computations uh, fully accurately either. Or the results may not need to have perfect accuracy, for instance, in cases where it's a human consuming the results, we're very good at interpolating. Now, these approximations open up a very interesting trade off between accuracy and resources. The more accurate I want to have a result, the more I will have to pay in terms of time, energy, memory, and so on. And naturally, we want to pick the sweet spot. So just enough accuracy that it's enough for our application, but not too expensive, so we don't have to pay too much. Unfortunately, navigating this trade-off is really hard for several reasons. First of all, well, how big is that accuracy? How big are these errors in the first place? Doing this manually just by looking at a computation is next to impossible, I would say. So then, say we can verify the accuracy, we want to introduce these approximations. But where in the program? That's quite often also not obvious, which part of the program is robust. Then once we know where to apply them, which approximation do we actually pick? And, well, as a computer scientist in programming languages, I obviously want to do all of this in a fully automated way. So at this point, I want to make a distinction that what I'm talking about here in this talk is different from the traditional optimization you may have in a compiler. A compiler usually does semantics preserving transformations, whereas here we're talking more about something like approximate computing, where we're purposely reducing the accuracy in order to save resources. And we just want to make sure that we're not reducing the accuracy too much. So that's a very general picture. Um, that's a bit too general to solve uh, completely. So here I'm focusing on numerical programs, partly because I like them, partly because it, they provide a very natural notion of what an approximation is, what is the accuracy metric, and they cover uh, many interesting applications and embedded systems or scientific computing. So we have enough benchmarks and we can, this can actually be useful, particularly because in these domains people do care both about the accuracy and the performance. Okay, so approximations are nothing new. They have been applied since the um, beginning of computing, especially in embedded systems and scientific computing. So here I want to give you a very, very uh, simplified state of the art just to explain where this work fits in. So while approximations have been applied for a while, 
people have done so manually. So someone went in, looked at the program, and decided, okay, here I'm going to do polynomial approximation of degree 10. This is quite costly. This uh, requires experts and is also error prone. On the programming languages side, where we want to do some of the um, automation, people have been working, especially in recent years, on automating some of these approximations and the verification. But the efforts have been bits and pieces all over the place without many comparisons, uh, let alone combinations. So I want to really bridge the gap. And the vision here is that I want to uh, build something that I call the approximating compiler, where the um, developer or scientist can write the ideal program they really want to compute if they had infinite resources, together with an accuracy and a resource specification. And then what they will get in the end is an approximated finite precision program that can actually be executed on real hardware together with a correctness certificate that the accuracy is satisfied. And then we want to do this fully automatically. <coughs> so we want to really replace that magic lamp here. To make that a bit more concrete, um, so here's a hypothetical example that's inspired by some work in embedded systems where uh, people have developed a heartbeat classifier that takes as input a signal um, that's that comes from an uh, embedded sensor. Um, they have developed a machine learning classifier to say whether this heartbeat signal is normal or abnormal, with the idea that if it's not normal, then it will raise an alarm or something like this. Now, the original implementation uses an exponential function that's part of the classifier and is implemented in high precision arithmetic. This is what's needed to actually make that machine learning um, classifier. Uh, the, on the training side uh, work. However, this is not implementable on that little embedded device that this is supposed to run on. So what the people did, they took the exponential function, replaced it by a piecewise linear approximation, and took the high precision arithmetic and implemented it in a few bits of fixed point arithmetic. Now this whole translation was done completely manually, and then they came to us and asked us whether we can verify that this classifier still computes something useful. Yes. Just to clarify, the exponential function is, is what was learned by the training process. Exactly. Okay. Except that on that device, there's no floating point units. Yes. Yes. There's no mathematical library. So all you have is just integers. Okay, so they did this fully, ma fully manually with all sorts of tricks in the implementation. So after the fact, there's not much we can verify about this. So instead, what we want to do is do this translation correct, uh, so fully automatically and correct by construction. So do the synthesis and the verification at the same time. So today, I want to present our current state of the art, to, well, our current state of the tool that's supposed to do this. Um, we're not quite yet there at the very end of that vision, of that goal, but I think we've made something. So in this talk, I will focus on the finite precision aspects. I will present some optimizations or approximations that we perform. And I will talk about uh, our verification procedure for accuracy under discrete choices. So what Daisy can currently do, it will take a real value program as the input together with an accuracy specification, which will look like something like this. So this is a... Um, uh, this implements an approximation of sign, though here we're not worrying about the truncation error, so we're just taking this as an arithmetic expression. But it's one that you will see quite often in embedded systems. Um, the user has to specify a domain for the inputs because the round of errors introduced uh, will depend heavily on the input domain. You can specify an input error, so this is the absolute error on the input that may come from sensors or from some previous uh, computations. And the user can specify the maximum absolute error that he or she is willing to tolerate uh, at the input. When they will generate a finite precision program, either in floating point arithmetic, if a floating point unit is available and the user says so. For example, here, I think double floating point precision would satisfy the error specification. So here the code generation is not very interesting. 
or if a floating point unit is not available and you have to use only integers, then we can, uh, Daisy will also generate a fixed precision program, either with these explicit bit shifts or in a format that you can then compile to an FPGA. Yes? Uh, so does this simulate floating point unit or do you do something else? Simulate? If you are generating a fixed point arithmetic, you just uh, simulate a floating point unit in, with integers or you do something like that? Well, it effectively, so if you implement it with these bit shifts, yes. then you are effectively simulating what the floating point unit would have done. Okay. But, so this is not the best way to do fixed point arithmetic. In oh, okay. practice, what you do is you generate C code with annotations that are then compiled to an FPGA, where you don't have these explicit bit shifts. Um, but if the question was what fixed point arithmetic is, then. No, no, I was most curious whether the, whether the left and the right programs are equivalent, or if you're doing some completely different. No, they're equivalent up to um, accuracy. Yes. And, and if it yes. fails to check, will it say no, I can't generate it? Yes, then then we'll just. Yes. So if you do specify an error, so you yeah. can also just not <laughs> specify an error and just yeah. say, okay, give me the error for this precision. Yeah. But if you do specify the error, it will just uh, complain. Yeah. Okay, so in order to do this, we have to um, check the accuracy. In this, uh, in this case, we're interested in the worst case accuracy. Um, so, as I said, the user specifies the absolute errors. So for absolute errors, we use a, a standard data flow analysis to compute them. And I'm just going to go very briefly over this. Um, because I think the other stuff is more interesting. But just to give you an idea, it's a standard data flow analysis. We use interval and affine arithmetic as the abstract domains. We in also use interval subdivision to get tighter error bounds uh, to reduce the over approximation. And we have some limited support for conditionals and loops. I don't think that's the final answer yet. Um, but anyway. So in these, uh, the static data flow analysis works equally for both fixed point and floating point arithmetic. Now you may say, well, absolute errors are not always the best measure of the accuracy. So relative error can be the better choice in many cases. Unfortunately, you have the division here. So whenever the range of uh, the expression you're trying to compute includes zero, then that expression is not well defined. Now, if that is not the case, then uh, we can do a global optimization to compute relative errors, which is much tighter than first computing absolute errors and then the relative errors, but this only works for floating point arithmetic. Okay, so that's all I want to say on this part. Uh, for the rest of the talk, I'll assume that we're computing absolute errors with the data flow analysis. Um, but just before I go there, uh, I mentioned at the beginning that we want to have a correctness certificate. So that doesn't just mean that the tool has printed out the number. We have some preliminary work uh, where DAISY, in addition to the program and the round of errors, also generates a certificate in Kong and Hall 4 that can be checked independently. So this is, doesn't yet work for all of the verification techniques, but it's getting there. So, yeah. so this uh, fifth degree Taylor expansion, so you're not at all trying to verify that this has anything to do with sign, right? So not at this point. So this is ongoing work where we're trying to, to do that as well. For now, we're just worrying about the finite precision. That says if um, the user provides, so uh, Daisy also supports transcendental functions, but we'll assume that you have a library implementation of it. You could specify that you have another implementation, and if you know how to compute the errors for that one, given a domain, then you could pop this in as well. Okay, so now that we can verify these uh, expressions, let's try to optimize them. And I'm going to talk about two different optimizations, and then how to combine them together. So as you probably all know, finite precision arithmetic is not associative. So if we change the order of the computation, we'll get a different result, and we'll get different errors. So if we want to compute sound error bounds, then we have to fix the evaluation order. DAISY generates source code that then has to be compiled by a regular compiler. So then we need to specify, for instance, for GCC, that it's not allowed to use some fast math optimizations or something like this. 
However, we can also use the fact that this is not associative and try to find the order of the computation that has the smallest error that we can prove. Um, and we want to do this such that the, uh, the final expression is still uh, equivalent to the original, original one under real value semantics. And unlike in a general compiler, this is sound for us because our input language was real valued, which I may have forgotten to mention. Okay, so that's our goal. We want to just find the best evaluation order. Unfortunately, the search space is very large, so we can't just go through all of the possible evaluation orders. And also, unfortunately, we were not able to find some kind of guidance in this search space. So something like gradient descent, unfortunately, doesn't work here because of the discrete nature. Dynamic programming also doesn't work, because even if you optimize the sub um, part of the expression, globally this may not be optimal. <coughs> so we, our solution actually uses a genetic algorithm, which may sound a little bit unsatisfying, but it seems to work quite well, to my own surprise. So how this algorithm works, uh, we take 30 copies of the original expression and then repeatedly pick one from the so-called population. We will mutate it, so we will apply associativity or distributivity rules randomly somewhere in the uh, expression. And then we use our static round of error analysis to check how big the error is and whether it's gotten smaller. And then we'll just repeat, so gradually we will come come up with uh, better and better expressions. And why this works is, in the first step, when we pick the expressions, that picking is guided by the fitness, so by the errors that we have computed. Expressions that have a smaller error are more likely to be picked. On the other hand, uh, we're not greedily picking the best ones, so we always have a bit of a chance to pick a bad expression, so that we, well, we can somewhat avoid uh, local minima here. And by doing this, we can get quite impressive results. Uh, so we can get up to 70% improvements, at least on our benchmarks, which especially for an embedded system is quite interesting because this means your, if this was your controller that you're optimizing, it will make it more stable. So I said we're using static analysis as the fitness function. So this means that we're selecting the expression for which we can prove a smaller round of error. So this is not necessarily the expression that actually has the smallest round of error, because our static analysis always uh, includes, uh, so we'll commit some over approximation. Now this is in principle fine, because if you care about soundness, then you care about the thing that you can prove it has the smallest round of error, but we would still like to know whether this somehow corresponds to the true errors. Uh, we checked this with an empirical experiment, so we took random rewritings of an expression, and we measured the error with our analysis and then with a dynamic analysis which provides an under approximation of the, of the error but a pretty tight one. So for a linear expression this looks really good. So this means whenever the expression, our analysis says the expression is better than it is truly better. So you can guess what comes next. So for nonlinear expressions this doesn't look quite as good but there's still um, a correlation. Uh, this is effectively due to the fact that our analysis can keep track of linear correlations and for nonlinear ones it has to do an approximation. Any questions to this part? Uh, how nonlinear are these uh, problems that you tested at? How do you measure <laughs> nonlinear? I mean, are they uh, almost uh, linear, just a bit of a credit term, or are they actually with sharp tangents or something? So this one, I guess, wasn't close to non was not close to just linear, though I'm not quite sure how to measure it. So there's in this expression, I think there were plenty of multiplications. Okay, so that was the order of computation. Let's put that aside for a little bit. Um, we'll come back to it later. Uh, but before we do that, I want to talk about the other optimization, which now is really uh, an approximation, if you wish. So suppose we have this nonlinear controller, and I think this is the one that I used in the experiment. Or at least it's something, so I don't know how nonlinear this is. 
All right, suppose this is the error that we need to satisfy, which was provided by some embedded systems engineer. Now, our analysis will tell us that if we use uniform double precision, then this is just not going to be enough. So if we just rely on uniform precision, then we will have to upgrade all of the operations to, in this case, quad. Well, this is the next uh, implementation I have found. Which will satisfy this error bound by a huge margin. So this will completely over provision uh, on the accuracy side. And it will also be significantly slower than double precision because this will be implemented uh, in software. However, so I said double precision is just not enough. So maybe if we could just add a little bit of accuracy to it, then this would be sufficient. And we can do this with mixed precision. So in this implementation, I've marked with D the operations that are implemented in double floating point arithmetic, so in the lower precision, and four that are implemented in the higher quad precision. Now this will still satisfy that error bound, but it will be roughly 28% faster than if you had just used uniform quad precision. Now it's very difficult to figure out which operation should be in which, uh, which order. It's absolutely not obvious. You'll have to believe me that this is the case. So obviously we want to do this uh, fully automatically. So we want to find the mixed precision assignment that satisfies the error bound and executes faster. So here the accuracy, that's our hard constraint. That's the part that we can guarantee. Um, the better execution, that's best effort. Uh, purely because it's quite hard to predict performance, especially of floating point uh, programs. As before, the challenge here is the large search space. So just going through all the possible type assignments is next to impossible. And in addition here, we have to estimate the, uh, the performance somehow. And this gets tricky, especially because when we have mixed precision, we are introducing cast operations be between different types. This is expensive. So it's not always better to have mixed precision. Uh, and it's difficult to figure out where these cast operations are beneficial and why not. So in this case, we're again doing an incomplete search uh, with the static error analysis uh, to check the accuracy. And we also have a static cost function um, to uh, pr predict the performance. Our incomplete search is what's been dubbed as the delta debugging algorithm that was also used by Chris Monius, uh, but for an uh, unsound uh, tuning. And I'll just step through an example to explain how this algorithm works. So this box represents um, a list of all the arithmetic operations in our program. So we just take them in the order in that they appear. And the number means that um, all of the operations are initially in the higher precision, so in this case quad. So we first check whether this satisfies the error bound, and if it does, then we can continue. If it didn't, then we can stop at this point, because even the higher precision doesn't satisfy the error bound. Then we will lower all of the operations to the lower precision and check again. Now, if this does not satisfy the error bound, then we know that what we want is somewhere in the middle. And then, at that point, we'll just split the list. So we will lower some of the arithmetic operations and keep the others in the higher precision. And check again. Suppose here it doesn't satisfy either. So then we'll continue the split until eventually we will find some type assignments that do satisfy the accuracy bound. Well, if we have several of them that satisfy the accuracy bound, then we need to select the one that we actually want. And for that, we use the cost function uh, to select. Now, in this case, we do want to use a cost function. We don't want to just run the program, because just benchmarking floating point programs is difficult enough. So ideally, especially when we have several of them, it's convenient to have a cost function. And in this case, we have a cost function for floating point arithmetic. And initially, we thought, well, we'll just go to, the, to someone from the worst case execution time community and ask them if they can provide us with an analysis. We don't really need the worst case execution time, but it probably is a good proxy, just like the static error analysis is. Unfortunately, as soon as you say floating point arithmetic, then everyone says no can do. This uh, is just too complicated, the hardware is too complex, um, so that's not going to work. So what we did, we devised several benchmarks and just tested them uh, empirically. 
The first one I call simple because I just went in and assigned some abstract costs of uh, I think one to addition, three to multiplication, four to division, something like this. Based on just my intuition of, well, I'm not a hardware expert, so it's very simple. Um, the other one um, I benchmarked different, so individual arithmetic operations separately. So I just ran a million additions, a million multiplications, and then just took the relative running times. The other cost function was based on operation count. So we count how many operations we have in which uh, precision. And then we also checked whether we could just use the error bound as a proxy. So the idea is that if your errors are smaller, then probably your running time is going to be larger. And we did this empirically, so we devised the experiment which I call or we checked the ability to discriminate. So in our algorithm, we don't really need the absolute running times, we just need the relative ones. We need to know which expression is better than the other. So we just took random type assignments and always compared two and checked how often the cost functions are able to pick the correct one. Here are the results. So if our type assignments are only between single and double floating point precision, then the benchmark cost function is actually better. It's still not terribly good, but it's better than a random guess. And it's better than my intuition here, which actually wasn't so bad. <laughs> <laughs> so if you do have quad precision as well, then somewhat surprisingly, the simple cost function uh, actually does well, which is mainly due to the fact that the cost of quad is so much bigger than the others. And we're currently working on an accurate cost function for fixed point arithmetic. Now this is tricky just to give you an idea because the cost heavily depends on the FPGA compiler, so we somehow need to figure out uh, how to approximate the performance of that work. Yes? Does, does the cost also depend greatly on the, the actual value you're evaluating? Or are you assuming it's, that, that it's independent of that? Um, I did not see any dependence in the experiments. Um, so I tried to check, so I essentially ran it once with uh, random inputs uh, within the range that was specified for the benchmark, and once with just one input repeatedly, and I could not really see a difference. Now, I do know that if you have denormal numbers, then the performance does differ. I probably we did not really see many of those here. Just one yeah. short question. Does, does this depend on uh, that depends on the hardware you're using? Yes. Right? So yeah. you would have to sort of rerun that one. Yes. Whatever your target is. Exactly. So in this case, if you're moving to a different hardware and not don't have exactly the same thing as on my desktop, then you would have to regenerate that benchmark cost function. Which is not that big of a deal, but yeah. Uh, so this makes your optimization deterministic. So from one compilation to the next, you might get different performance, right? Either your search algorithms, or they are they exhausted? No. And so the, the algorithms are deterministic. So the mixed precision tuning is deterministic. You will always go through. You will always split in exactly the same ways. Okay. Now the the rewriting that has that uses random numbers. So you know up to the seed, it will be deterministic. Right. But that means that you might be able to, you might make changes to the of how the function and cause another function that stop getting the performance previously. Yeah. Does it uh, change how the um, Yes. So have you encountered this in practice? Is this just, is this just a theoretical concern as well? No, it's, it does appear in practice. So uh, for the rewriting, that does depend somewhat on, on the on the seat. But there were essentially in our experiments you would see two or three different rewritings that would be uh, returned, not more. So if you change the seats, then you may get a different one, but you may not get, you know, if you run it 100 times, you wouldn't get 100 different rewritings. I, I, I think the concern is that if you, if you have a program and compile it, that's deterministic fine. You add another aspect to the program, which may be in some dead code, uh, which you're never going to run. Nevertheless, when you're doing your op your analysis, the, that's going to change the random number generation for the, the genetic algorithm, and so you'll get a difference. Uh, but you're doing this at compile time, so... Yeah, so um, 
but, it, but by, change, by, by making a change to the program uh, that introduces some, some code that is never used in execution, but is, is seen by the compiler, um, you, will, you might get completely different runtime, uh, a, a, a different decision made by the genetic algorithm language. Sure. I mean, but that's going to be exactly the, the, the same kind of change when you just change the seed. Yes. Yes. No, that, that can happen, yes. So you said you can get with, with 100 different compilations, you've got maybe four different rewrites. Yes. But then they all perform the same. So were they equivalent in some sense? Um, so the round of errors uh, are more or less the same. Yes. So they're very close. However, I'll come to that just in a second. What is the alarm? It's just a vehicle outside, I think. Sorry? It's a reversing vehicle outside. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we just talked about rewriting that can improve the round of errors. And then there's precision, which improves performance. So, well, I'm suggesting here this, that we just want to combine them and improve the performance even more. The, the idea is that the rewriting will give us a little bit more leeway that then the mixed precision tuning can use to lower maybe some more operations. So this actually works. So in our running example here, now remember before we had three operations and doubles, now we can have four and only three and quad. So effectively this means that well, we still satisfy the error bound, but we are now roughly 43% faster than the quad precision. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I don't know if you're aware of this, but there is in the microelectronics world a new uh, number format under development called, it was originally called UNUM, and now it's called POSIT. Uh, yes. And it's developed by John Gustafsson. Um, it uh, has variable precision and range, and uh, the floating point numbers can have any byte length. Um, and it has uh, it obeys the associativity and distributivity laws. So your first problem goes away with those. Uh, the second aspect of these numbers is also very interesting for your calculations because um, it's an interval arithmetic scheme ultimately, so you can read out the errors um, right away when the computation performed. There's no estimating uh, necessary of what the electronics looks like and so on. And the electronics for this format is actually much simpler than the IEEE format. Uh, so uh, finally, after 70 years, uh, IEEE is getting uh, a kick, and in the butt, like you need to move on. Uh, there are very heated discussions on the web about this. Uh, but I think it is a, you know, in, in a 10-year time frame, this has a very good chance of winning. Yeah, it's just that. Uh, uh, Maybe so. The one thing that I'm not sure about this, so I'm, I'm aware of that work, is uh, about the performance. It's higher, actually, than uh, I think we performance. And fixed-point arithmetic? I mean, ultimately, many of these things are most interesting for fixed-point arithmetic, because yes, you can implement them on a couple of bits. That I don't know. Yeah. OK. So we were at optimizing this. And right, so we're optimizing uh, for the the, the errors. Uh, so we're improving the order of the <coughs> computation, and then we're picking some data types. Ideally, we want to do both of them at the same time, because the rewriting influences how the mixed precision tuning will work, and vice versa. Unfortunately, doing both at the same time just doesn't scale. So we have to split them. So we first do the rewriting, and then we do the mixed precision tuning. And we found out that just putting these together naively performed really badly. Um, this was partially due to the fact that if we just naively uh, optimize for the better error bounds, then we may actually increase the arithmetic uh, operation count, which will negate all of the performance improvements we get later. Um, also, the rewriting uses a fitness function that uses the static error analysis. That needs to know with respect to which precision it's computing the errors. However, that precision assignment is only uh, done in the second step, so we don't have that available in the first step yet. Um, now, right now, we use a uniform precision here, uniform double. Um, and empirically, we found that while this has some effect on the performance, so it does not give the absolute optimal results, the differences are not too large. 
So this essentially means that the rewriting will produce an evaluation order that's very similar no matter what kind of precision you use in the end. There may be slight differences, but usually they're uh, not large. For mixed precision tuning, um, we realized that since the rewriting has already fixed the evaluation order, the real value ranges of all the intermediate expressions that we need for the error analysis are fixed so we can cache this and save some running time. And somewhat surprisingly, we found that if your um, expression that you're optimizing has integer constants, it's not a good idea to just put them in the lowest precision. Now you might think, since it's an integer, then you can just do the simplest thing first, but this will introduce cast operations, which may just uh, negate all your performance. So here's some colorful, very colorful tables. Um, so we evaluated this on a number of benchmarks and compared it against a tool, uh, FPTuner, that also does mixed precision tuning, but without rewriting. And each of these blocks here corresponds to our set of benchmarks with a particular um, target error that we've chosen. So for example, here, this corresponds to the benchmark where single precision is just not enough. And we compare DAISY with only the mixed precision tuning, with only the rewriting, with both together, FP tuner, and then the pink one is where we have first done our rewriting and then run FP tuner on that expression. So uh, overall, we can see that if we're in the case where one precision is just not enough, then we can already get significant uh, performance improvements. So in the case of where we're choosing between single and double precision, we get average savings of 20% with respect to a uniform double precision. In the case where double precision is just not enough, our savings are bigger because of the software implementation. In general, we observe that um, rewriting and mixed precision tuning helps, so both of them are better uh, than just doing one of them, and this also holds for FP tuner. Um, for some cases, especially this one, Aptuna can provide uh, better solutions at a higher running time of the tool. So Aptuna performs a global optimization, which hits some scalability issues at some point if your expressions become bigger. So is that doing an exponential search through uh, choices of types of operators? I think so. Now, this also works only for floating point arithmetic, whereas our tool would work also for fixed point arithmetic. But since I don't have the numbers. Okay, so now we can optimize um, finite precision expressions. When I used to give this talk elsewhere, at this point I always got a question. In that example I had before, this example didn't just compute a number. It actually computed a discrete decision. It computed yes and no. Is this a good result or not? So if you put that in the context of this controller that I had before, instead of just computing a number here, what we're really computing is a result, and then based on that result, we're making a decision. So for instance, here we may raise a room, a, an alarm. I don't know, you're about to hit the wall or something like this. Now the problem here is that if we are to implement this in reals, it may happen that the real value execution should raise the alarm. But because we've committed some errors, the finite precision computation will just happily continue and run against the wall. So now let's put this in a slightly better uh, format, so just that we have numbers. If we now perform the worst case analysis that we had before, we will say, we'll have to say that the maximum error that we commit here is going to be one for whatever number the numbers are that you choose here. Because we always will commit some errors, so in the worst case, we'll always take the wrong decision. So this is not very useful. This is a very trivial result. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what we're really interested in here is how often will we actually get the wrong answer. You will definitely, so if you do want to lower the precision, so if you don't implement this in reals, you will always get some wrong decisions. This is completely unavoidable. But we want to just check that this is not happening too often. And this is, in fact, the answer that we were asked by the guys um, from uh, that example before. 
Is that really what you want? You know, how often it is? This is what they ask us. Okay, but that's interesting because it, it, it could also be, you know, how how close would it, would it be? You know, how how big of a of a you know the decision between whether the result is less than zero is that an answer? Is that on a small interval? And and that might be what you're interested in, and not you know it might be a big uh, big change, and then you don't get the error. Okay, I don't control. So, so how often you get the error is, is that not, that, that's, so I'm just worried that, that's so you're asking not so much how often you get the error, but how wrong the comparison was. Yes. Okay, well, I mean, in this case it's trivial. Um, now, if this was n not just 0 or 1, but there was some more arithmetic operations here, then yes, you have essentially the same problem. Your real, real value execution can diverge from the finite precision one. Now, in that case, we do have an analysis that can compute how large that difference will be. Um, I haven't talked about this here. It's quite expensive, but yes, you can do that as well. So here, the difference is that you have a discrete decision. So you don't really care so much about how big the, the divergence is, but really how often you will just get the wrong answer. Because the, the difference is trivial. You can just read it from the... So in other words, you care only about uh, differences that are close to zero anyway. If you don't care about 100 versus 200, you just care about minus uh, 0 0.1 to plus 0.1. I mean, these numbers here are just made up. Mm. Um, so it's the comparison, right? You're asking. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, the comparison is the I think both questions are about the comparison, the, the result less than or equal to 0 0.0. And uh, you, you might be concerned about uh, getting true for that when really the answer should be false because res should have been 100 and you've computed it to be slightly less than zero. Uh, that's an egregious error, uh, but in terms of the red audience, it's just as bad as a, as a very close to zero error. Sort. I guess for that, then you really want to just analyze the arithmetic expression yeah. and see what. Yeah. So you or, don't... or you could put a cost function on your error. Or so, so, so they, so they, I, I they, they decide. You can just use the, the analysis. That they, they, they just use that as a cost function. So here I'm I'm assuming that you know uh, you will have some inputs that will be somewhere around. So you will have some results um, that will be somehow around zero, and you just cannot avoid this. So the problem here is introducing discontinuity in the arithmetic, isn't it? So yes. when it, when it was multiplications and subtractions before, it was all continuous stuff. Exactly. Now this, this was all continuous, and now suddenly it's discrete. Okay, so in order to answer this question of how often we get the wrong answer, we actually need to do a probabilistic analysis. So this means we need to get probability distributions on our inputs. We need to propagate them through the continuous computation so that we get a distribution of the result here. And then from that, we can essentially read off how often we will do the wrong answer. Now in this case, for um, I think for Gaussian inputs, this is actually the distribution that you get if you just simulate this. So you can see that around zero, this is actually quite relatively likely that you may do the uh, may make a wrong uh, decision, which then you can give the <coughs> embedded systems engineer to figure out how to fix this, for instance, or I don't know, use a, a higher precision. Okay, now we want to do this automatically, obviously. But the challenge here is that we need to propagate these distributions, and we need to do that accurately and efficiently. So if you don't do it accurately, then we may just completely over-approximate uh, the probabilities, and it shouldn't take forever, obviously. So in this setting, um, in our, so I'm just simplifying this problem a little bit. Uh, so we are we assume that we have given a possibly non-linear arithmetic expression, an input distribution for the, for the inputs. Um, you can also specify whether they're dependent or independent uh, on each other. The decision threshold, so in our example that would be essentially the zero here. Um, and a uniform finite precision that you're assuming for the implementation. So in this case, we just assume uniform, not the mixed precision. And the goal is to compute a sound upper bound on the wrong path probability. So the probability of making the wrong decision. One way of doing this 
is to encode this wrong path probability as a probabilistic program. So in some syntax of the PSI tool, we can say, for example, here, um, our inputs are uniform between minus 15 and 15. That's the continuous, um, uh, continuous computation. The round of error we have externally computed with our tool. And then this assert statement essentially says that your result could be somewhere around zero within the error bound. And then you can compute the exact expression for the wrong path probability using the tool PSI, and then solve it numerically with Mathematica while specifying the precision you want to get on the result. So this sounds cool because this will give us the exact probability if it works. Unfortunately, for even this example, this times out after even after 20 minutes. And even giving it more time doesn't really uh, work. Which bit gets stuck? Sorry? Where does it get stuck? Is it mathematical with the problem? Or? It could be either one. So we found that on some benchmarks, either both of them actually return relatively fast or not at all. So even letting it run for hours uh, would not really. So Mathematica was particularly funny. Either it returned within a second or just went off and did whatever. <laughs> okay, so the problem here effectively is that this uh, exact expression is very complicated. If you look at the output that PSI provides, this is pages and pages of uh, formulas. So that clearly doesn't work if we want to get uh, some interesting uh, controllers into this. So what we do instead, we do a probabilistic static analysis. So we take our continuous distributions and we discretize them. The usual trick, we use an abstraction. The um, discretization that we use here um, is uh, so-called uh, DSI, uh, density Schaefer uh, interval arithmetic. So this means we um, represent the distribution, respectively we represent a set of distributions by a list of intervals with weights. So this means that the value of um, the variable that we're representing here can be between A1 and B1 with probability W1. Now this map does not just represent a single distribution, but a whole set of dis distributions. So in this graph, any distribution that somehow fits into those two boxes is represented. Now obviously if we have more subdivisions here, then we'll get more accuracy, but the computation will, will be more costly. If we have independent arithmetic, this just reduces to standard interval arithmetic, so that's pretty easy. If we have dependent arithmetic, so that means we say do a multiplication between two values that can be possibly dependent on each other, then this reduces to a linear programming problem. Now the intuition behind that is, I don't want to go into the details because that would completely, <laughs> we wouldn't get coffee. Um, so the reason here is that we have uncertain distributions, so when we compute uh, an operation with possibly dependent uh, operators, we have to keep track of all the possible dependencies. That's essentially an optimization problem, which is also what, it make, what makes it quite costly. This also means that we can have to keep track of these dependencies between the variables, uh, and for that we use a fine arithmetic. So this part uh, was presented before, um, and I just want to explain first how this really works in the overall scheme. So we take the, the input I mentioned before. We first uh, perform a round of error analysis with our expression and the precision that was uh, specified. We get some error, here just 0.01. Um, so that's a random error just because it's easier to uh, pronounce. Then we do a probabilistic analysis. So we again take our um, expression, the real value expression, we take the input distributions and we compute a discretized propagated distribution. Together with the error threshold then, we can compute the wrong path probability. Um, and we do this by computing the intersection, so if this was the final um, distribution that we computed, and suppose the decision threshold was 0 and the error was 0.01, this, this means that we're interested in this band around uh, zero. And as you can see, this band intersects with the focal element with weights W2 and W1. So this means that the 
probability will be W1 plus W2. Okay, this is fine. This actually works, so we get a result for our uh, benchmarks, but unfortunately we compute the probability of making the wrong decision, which is one. So fine, we got a result, but it's essentially <laughs> useless. Um, well, at this point we were not quite happy. Um, so what we then uh, figured out that we have to do is we have to subdivide the input intervals. So what was happening before, why we got the one here, is that band, so it actually didn't look like this, where it just intersected with two, but it intersected with all of them. So the over-approximation that uh, we were committing was just too large. So one of the standard ways to reduce this over-approximation is to do interval subdivision. So we in, um, subdivide the input distributions and then perform the probabilistic analysis on each of them separately. Just by the fact that we have smaller intervals, we commit uh, less over-approximations. However, this is super costly because, as I said, the probabilistic analysis has to call the LP solver several times and then we do this on many sub, uh, subdomains. But we also observe that many of these subdomains cannot actually reach the area around that decision threshold that we're interested in. So what we do is uh, we do a reachability check with just a simple SNT solver, so this is not probabilistic and we check whether there is some possibility of reaching that. Either the solver tells us no, well then we just disregard the subdomain. If the solver says yes or I don't know, there's essentially a timeout, then we do perform the probabilistic analysis. And then we finally get a somewhat useful answer. <laughs> so in this example then we can compute uh, the probability of roughly 7% to make the wrong decision. All right, so this is one example. We ran it obviously on several ones. Um, and here I'm comparing the blue one is uh, the exact inference, the yellow one is just the probabilistic static analysis, and then the green one, that's our final solution. So the green one, whenever, uh, sorry, the yellow one, whenever it hits one, this means it just computed the probability of one, so the, the useless answer, and as you can see, it actually does that very often. Not always, so there's some benchmarks where it's actually uh, doing pretty well, but not always. Now, PSI, whenever that hits one, that's a timeout. And as you can see here, you either see just once or you don't see anything at all. So for the ones where you don't see anything at all, it actually computed something, but the probability was very small, so it doesn't show up here because it's the exact one. Um, and with our final solution with the interval subdivision, we actually get a result uh, always and usually a reasonable one. Now a very interesting com uh, comparison is in those cases where PSI actually did produce a number, so these were tiny benchmarks, but still, because this gives us a comparison against the truth, the, the true result. And as you can see, we're roughly one to two orders of magnitude away uh, from the exact result, which I think is a pretty good compromise since we're doing abstractions here. Can, can you assume that by more subdivisions. Yes, yeah. you can change that way. Does it become very slow in that way? Or? Well, it can become essentially arbitrarily slow. Now, currently, the implementation is not super efficient because we use uh, rational arithmetic in our own um, operations just to avoid round of errors internally. Um, so far, this was not a problem. This was the first case where this actually became a problem because the rationals are implemented on top of big integers and they can just grow very large. We're currently working on improving that by using interval arithmetic internally uh, with MPFR. Still work in progress and it's on my to-do list. Okay, so that's essentially what I wanted to say today. So I hope I've given you some uh, overview of what DAISY can do. So what I presented was two parts of it, there's more. Um, especially, so essentially the certificates that I haven't mentioned at all. We also have a dynamic uh, error analysis if you need to get under approximations. And as I mentioned, we're currently working on also dealing with the elementary function approximations. The code is on GitHub, so you can try. Um, I think it works reasonably well if you have uh, any 
box to report, then please do so. And, well, I haven't talked much about the functional programming side, uh, which I was a bit worried about since the, the workshop talks about functional side. So, the whole thing is implemented in Scala. Um, <laughs> and mostly functionally. Now, there is some mutable states, just because that just made it so much easier. Okay. Any questions? why I think it's very interesting. I work for, uh, uh, on the design of the super large radio telescope, the square kilometer array, and uh, the biggest computational problem has to do with memory bandwidth. Uh, it, it blows everything done before. We're talking about 200 petabytes per second in memory bandwidth, and, and you can count zeros in, in your hotel room. And for example, the computer that costs 10 megawatts of power alone to move that data. The best approach we think to reduce that at the moment is to look at variable precision computation so that we can shrink the number sizes. Um, and so in this context, I want to ask you two questions. Um, so the computations that this telescope will do, they are a whole sequence of essentially optical filters that uh, you know transform graphics, much like what happens in cameras, but the data structure is a bit different. So the first question is, is there a rule for composition of functions? Because there, there are hundreds behind each other, yeah, and we need sort of some kind of framework where we can track the, uh, the, the, the rules that tell you how errors accumulate if you do um, if you go across hundreds of algorithms. Yeah, so right now, you would essentially just have to do the analysis one by one. Um, so, we have very briefly looked at modular verification. So right now, Daisy will analyze each function separately. So in your case, you would just have to write, change your codes in our, into our format and just chain everything together to do the analysis end to end. Now, for the modular verification, this is tricky. Um, so this was our consensus. And I'm not sure this would actually compute better results. Because if you do the modular verification, you'll have to add one level of abstraction. So if you were really interested in very tight error bounds, you're probably better off just unrolling, essentially, or inlining all your expressions. Does that answer your question? Or? So maybe, if maybe it answers so in a way like it needs more fault. <laughs> so I guess there's two parts of it. Now, what you can already do today is just extract your computation and just put it one after another. So if your functions are called one after another, then this is perfectly fine. Then you can just do the analysis as is today. If you have loops in there, then that's going to become tricky and that will definitely need more thought. Um, if you were looking for an analysis that will just analyze every function separately, then that's the part that we don't really know how to do well yet. So the, I mean, I think it's a very good answer. Uh, the, you know, you would kind of hope that you get some kind of interval calculation composition rule, right? So if you, if you have so, so basically you have intervals in the input that map to intervals of uncertainty in the output and you want to get a sort of composition rule that you can track. Yeah. I mean, that you can definitely do. But I'm not sure that this will produce the most accurate results because whenever you get, at the interface you're losing some information. Yeah. Uh, so the second question is really, have you done any optimization about bandwidth as opposed to performance? Because that is the killer for HPC calculation. If you can give me a cost function, we can do it. So right now, we don't really care what you're optimizing for. Oh, but that's extremely easy. Uh, so because uh, the, it's just the fetching time from uh, essentially RAM. You pay that price one time, and it's 100 times yeah. higher than caches. So. so all I need is just you tell me for this precision, for this arithmetic operation, here's the cost. Yeah. And how do I compute that for the whole uh, question?
I'm wondering what you mean by error is basically always an L infinity norm. So the, the maximum uh, discrepancy between the two correspondent L infinities. Is there also any um, uh, work on doing this for some other kind of norm that perhaps makes correlation to the account between uh, individual elements? So, not in that form. That said, our analysis does take correlations into account, but on the linear ones. So for computing the, well, let me revise that answer. So for the error analysis, what you need to do is you need to track the ranges of all your intermediate expressions because they influence the size of the errors. And then you need to track the errors. So for the ranges, you can use interval or fine arithmetic. So that will track, in the best case, linear correlations. Um, you, we also can use an SMT solver to track some of the nonlinear correlations as well. Now the bottleneck there is the solver, the SMT solver. So if that cannot handle an expression anymore, then you're just down to whatever uh, interval or fine arithmetic. For the errors, we just use a fine arithmetic, so we only track linear correlations. And we found that this works reasonably well because the errors tend to be small. So the nonlinear terms you actually get, they're even smaller than the linear terms. So for that case, it's actually fine. I suppose, except that you have such sub boundaries like in the Boolean case. Then, yeah, then, then yeah. completely non -linear. Yeah, then, then. You also mentioned uh, limited branch control. Uh, how would you, what do you mean by limited and how would you affect it? Okay, so this is limited in two ways. So for the conditionals, the problem is that you will get a divergence. And if you don't have the discrete case, but you still have a continuous computation, because our uh, baseline is the real value of computation, we want to just know how big could the difference be. Because it could happen that it's fine that you do a divergence, because on those inputs, the differences anyway won't be that large between the, the branches. So we want to bound that difference. The problem there is that the two branches that you're essentially comparing, they're usually tightly correlated. Which means that if you use something like interval arithmetic, it will just give you a completely useless answer. So there we rely again on the SMT solver and the bottleneck is the solver. So whenever the expression is too large for the solver to handle, then we don't really, can't really say that much. For the loops, the problem is that in general, errors will accumulate with every iteration. So they will just get bigger and bigger with each iteration. So if you use something like abstract interpretation, the errors that you will get will be just infinity, just a trivial result, unless you have a very specific uh, case of uh, some linear filter, but in general this doesn't work. Um, what you can do is unroll the loop if you have a bounded number of iterations, but this will very quickly hit the scalability uh, issue with any uh, analysis in this space. What we have done is for certain kinds of loops, um, we have a way to express the error as a function of the number of loop iterations, which avoids the loop unrolling in the analysis. But the assumption is that the user can so say you iterate over one variable x. Um, we rely on the fact that you can tell us the range of that variable through all of the iterations. So that it's bounded and you can provide the bounds. Right now we're not able to actually prove that bound ourselves. So that's what I said with limited. Yeah. So, uh, so, so with FP, PDH you can, uh, you can execute things in parallel. Uh, so is that something you are doing and dealing with as well? So on the FPGA side for that compilation, we rely on the Xilinx high-level synthesis tool right now. So we generate C codes with the annotations. So the annotations say this is the bit length and so many bits are reserved for the integer part. That's the part we can do that falls out of our analysis. Um, the parallelization we leave to the synthesis tool. We don't do that. I'm not a scientist. Sorry, I'll go. Draw, well, I won't get a copy, so if we could draw the questions so that I can catch a light and, and perhaps we could back a one more time.